Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Claudius Islescu, and um, I'll present you the latest news from the Libavik Yale, and especially the things which are related to CTF backend. This uh, talk was done together with Doji, which is the maintainer of Libavik Yale. He is not here, but you can find him next week at the LPC. Um, this is the outline of the presentation. I will start with a short, very short introduction, a bit of background, then we'll dive into what is Libabigail, what are the enhancements there, some experiments, and of course the last slide will be some conclusions. Well, this talk is, as I said, about Libabigail and especially the um, CTF uh, support in the Libabigail. Libabigail is an open uh, source framework for ABI analysis. And CTF, as you know, it's a compact debugging information which describes C types and association between function symbols, data symbols, and types. What is interesting with Libabigail is that it supports various debug information like CTF, BTF, and DWARF. And we will use those debugging uh, uh, debug formats in a dynamic way. So if you don't have CTF, it will fall down on debug information. If, if you don't have BTF, it will go to CTF and debug as well. So a bit of background, what is CTF? CTF stands as for compact type format. It uh, describes C types and the association between symbols and the, the types. What is interesting is that it's a very efficient in, sp uh, in a space and it has a simple structure. CTF is also supported by the latest uh, tools, GNU tools, GDB, uh, GCC, and uh, BINUTILS. GCC can generate CTF information by passing minus G CTF to uh, command line. One of the key, so here there are a couple of key features of CTF. Uh, it's a very compact. It's meant to have a minimal storage footprint. It uh, has a, a type description for all basic types, for structures, for unions, for enums and type defs. It cannot do the, the um, the vector types, so the vector types will not be <laughs> supported by CTF, but everything else can be supported. Uh, it has also a, a, an association with the symbols, with the functions, so it can uh, you know where a type is used in a, in a, a function argument and uh, or in a variable. Also, it has a hierarchical structure and. Uh, which is easy to be uh, parsed. The, simp uh, the advantage of CTF is its simplicity, I would say. So uh, it's, as I said, easily to parse and uh, compared with more complex formats like Dwarf. And because um, it has the, the the, the data there is deduplicated, so means that the data uh, in the CTF format is uh, it's not it's not duplicated. It doesn't use duplication. It uh, it has also an improved performance, which will lead to faster loading and processing time. We'll see this advantage later on in the documentation so in the presentation. To see a bit, to go to what is CTF versus the dwarf, I also went a bit and I described a bit the dwarf. What is dwarf? Of course, everyone knows what is dwarf. It's a wide, usually standardized debug information. It provides a rich, detailed debugging information of everything what you want in the uh, in, in your uh, uh, compiled uh, sources. It supports multiple programming languages from Go to 
C++ from ADA to, I don't know, Fortran. It has deta detailed information of everything you, you have there where it's happening, uh, where a function is, uh, what the, sorry, where a, 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 f a, um, a variable is uh, located in the memory or in the registers. You have uh, all the uh, information about the type descriptions and also supports a complex hierarchies, hierar hierarchies uh, which handles intricate uh, program structures. Also contains line number information, where it says what is happening with your variables at each moment of the time, and it's very scalable for large pro programs. These are the few advantages of DARF. Uh, it's, as I said, it's rich in details and uh, it's extensively tool support. It's, I think most of the tools, 99% of the tools which I know are using DARF as a, as a debugging language. And because DARF is standardized and it also has a flexibility in how to manage complex program constructs and situations. I try to uh, um, I, uh, conclude here a bit the comparison between CTF and DWARF uh, in a table. Um, basically, the, the, the CTF is highly compact rather, rather than DWARF. DWARF we know that is growing. <laughs> Uh, very large, we also need to, to, to zip it from time to time. CTF deals mostly with basic types, as I said, uh, things which you have in C, but for example, CTF cannot handle the, the vector type, which Dwarf can. Uh, it, both of them are having symbol associations. Uh, tool support, of course, Dwarf is very, uh, it's extensively used by, uh, by uh, Dwarf, it's extensively used by all the tools. CTF, it's uh, used by a few of them. Uh, one of them is uh, Liba Abigail, the other one is probably D-Trace. Um, the details, of course, uh, Dwarf is winning here. You have more details in, in, in what your program does. However, because CTF, it's is uh, less detailed, this means that you have a faster performance when you use it in your programs. Uh, CTF is primarily done from for C, while DARF can support everything, so, yeah. What, uh, what is LibAbigail? LibAbigail is, it's an application binary interface generic analysis and stands for application binary interface generic analysis in instrumentation library. It's an open source tool uh, for detecting ABI compatibility issues in ELF uh, binaries. And uh, it's used to ensure that changes in the shared libraries do not break compatibly with other software. So, um, we want to maintain, we want to check if, uh, if an, um, a shared library or an application is maintaining the ABA compatibility in Linux distribution in large uh, software projects. And uh, also it helps in automating, automating the detection of inco uh, software incompatibilities. Uh, so this helps for example, if you deploy uh, a library later on to detect if your library will break the system, which is already uh, at the customer side. Well, yes. Uh, just briefly, I, okay. on. Um, I agree with basically everything you said in that CTF to dwarf comparison with one 
uh, one difference, which is that CDF intends to be able to encode anything C can encode at global scopes. Um, decal tags aren't actually in C. They're a kernel-specific extension. Um, the, only, yeah. the only real thing we really can't encode at the moment is that there are some GCC attributes which can affect the type system, and we haven't got, and they can't be represented because, and, and I think int 128 can't be represented, and that's it. Yeah, I uh, think also C23 things like bits. I think also the standard dwarf cannot represent those things, so we use the GNU dwarf, <laughs> dwarf extensions there. They're coming. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Nick. So what you need, we need to understand from Lib Abigail is that the most important thing is that it builds an ABI representation, a corpus, from debug information, either that is CTF, BTF, or dwarf. Yeah. So that also uh, helps us, the Lib Abigail, to automatic, uh, to automate analysis of uh, of the build systems. You know, when we want to. Uh, check if uh, various um, uh, components of software components are compatible with our distribution. So it's very good for, for this uh, uh, task. So you have to think to libabigail that stays on top of libctf, which is part of binutils or libbpf, and it has its own dwarf uh, uh, library. So it's a library which stays on top of those libraries. It's abstracting everything up. There are some uh, key tools, uh, which few of them, there are more, which uses uh, libabigail, and they are coming with libabigail release. I will just go to a few of them. Uh, one of the interesting one it's ABI DW, which basically dumps the ABI information from a binary into an XML file. It can also analyze the, the whole Linux tree build, uh, build tree, sorry, and that will also generate an XML file. Once having this XML file, you can compare it with another uh, XML file generated by this ABIW using this ABI diff uh, um, tool. ABI diff also works directly on binaries. We, uh, you can also use ABI package diff, which will take, which will use RPMs, and uh, the other ones like lint and um, package ID are used also for uh, uh, extracting and checking the, the ABI. But they don't. They will not generate the XML file. So the one which generates XML file, it's ABAW. It's this. It's interesting because you can post-process the XML file as you like, and then ask the ABA diff to to uh, to generate a report for you. In the last half a year, we have some enhancements there. Uh, one of them is uh, enumerating dictionary in an archive rather than using their name. So uh, this is an automatic way. We improve the execution time for CTF backends uh, quite a, a lot from uh, last years. Uh, we also introduce a new test framework. Okay, for CTF backend, but in general, it's a new test framework which will use uh, a Linux uh, image to uh, to run the tests. So this is a big improvement because we can uh, clean or catch the errors as soon as possible. A lot of big bug fixing happened, and we improved the logging for the guys which likes to uh, see what is going on inside of uh, the libabigail and the tools related. Let's uh, look to a few of them. So here I'm looking to uh, the first item which you see, the enumerating dictionary in an archive, rather than using the name. It's basically implements in an automatic way the object dumps option CTF parents. Uh, this is, yes. Could you explain briefly, please, what a dictionary is in this context? So a dictionary, it's, uh, it it's basically contains a number of uh, uh, CTF um, entries. So if you have more uh, files, and each file has its own CTF, 
uh, say entry, this dictionary will create an, uh, uh, an, uh, 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 an a way to, to look over all those CTF uh, entries. I might be able to expand on this. The basic idea is that a, di a, a dictionary corresponds roughly to a C translation unit with the same rough approximate rules about what types can appear in it and so, and so on and so forth, except that the deduplicator can combine dictionaries into a single gigantic parent which contains types which have been migrated from lots of children to save space in them. So if you have multiple... Basically, it used to be called files in the old days, yeah. here, but they're not files, they're in sections. So. Yeah, if you have multiple CTF, they will, you will do, deduplicate them, you'll see what is uh, common, and will make a, a common structure, which will go to each of those uh, um, CTF structures, individual ones. So basically, uh, okay, Coming back, this fixes a an, uh, an, uh, command line which before was not working. It's uh, I, I wrote it here. So if you have uh, no older version of uh, LibABDA, this command will just crash. Now it's working. Another big improvement which we did is we improved the execution time of the CTF backend. And uh, we look a bit how the functions are sorted and variables. We also optimize the analyzing of the Linux kernel tree and uh, their uh, loadable modules binaries. And uh, let's see how this will uh, will do uh, this uh, city, uh, this improvement in time. So here I made the performance setup. So what I want is to dump the ABI information of a Linux tree, uh, a Linux kernel tree. So basically, you have a, you build your your Linux, and I just want to have the ABI representation of everything what is inside. We use this ABIW command with uh, CTF options and ILT, the Linux tree option. And here it's in a graphical way represented what is going on during this building of the ABI information of everything. So we don't filter on, on kernel ABI. So the, the tool will look to all modules and will analyze all the modules in, uh, in the Linux tree. So what you can see, this is a time memory consumption graph. It takes roughly 27 seconds, depends on your machine, can take one minute or, you know, it's around one minute or two minutes, and under one gigabyte of memory. Let's see what is happening with the dwarf, if you use only the dwarf uh, backend. So here we see that using the dwarf backend, it takes a, a longer time, it's tens of minutes, and consumes more memory. And this is because you need to do in the dwarf what the CTF already did, this, this uh, did duplication. So in the dwarf, you need to go and analyze in depth all the binaries and construct and simplify uh, the, the, the intermediate representation, which is used in the, in the Libaviger. Well, in, for CTF, you already have it. So you can see it's clearly it's a, it's a good thing if your project allows you to use the CTF backend rather than uh, the dwarf backend to analyze the ABIs. This is the same thing, but in a graphical banner. Uh, yes. Is there a solving corpus equivalent? Sorry? There we go. Oh, sorry. So the corpus that you get when you build it using CTF for the Linux tree yes, and are, Dorf, is it equivalent? Yes, they are equivalent, yeah. Uh, this is the same, and now I'm going to another experiment where I want to diff two kernel ABI. So I have the following setup, I have a Linux uh, 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 um, release, let's say version one, and I have a version two of re this Linux release, and I have a KABI whitelist 
the kernel ABI whitelist. It has 857 entries. It's important, uh, this number, because these numbers actually filters out what LibAbigail will uh, use to build the ABI corpus. Um, we use a different tool this time. We use the ABI package diff. It is, uh, the command line is given here. It is important to mention why we need a debug information RPM for CTF. We need because in our uh, uh, setup, the VM Linux image is uh, shipped with debug info, uh, in the uh, debug information package. Uh, so VM Linux is needed by Libabige for symbols. It, it, uh, whenever it needs uh, more information, which is doesn't found in CTF or BTF or Dwarf, it looks to the uh, Linux VM Linux image. The um, core package will also contain a CTF archive. It's uh, it's a patch which Nick did it. It's not upstream as far as I remember, and which contains uh, a CTF archive of the whole Linux uh, uh, distribution. So that is in the UAKIC uh, core. So uh, the white list is given as a minus W option. So let's see again the same Sorry, I should, graph. You know, I should expand on that. The intention is to get something upstream which will produce something like a CTF archive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that would be nice. It, it, uh, it, it, um, it may not be quite like that. We will be discussing this at LPC, uh, LPC later. Yeah, yeah. The mic. <laughs> um, the, uh, the comparisons between CTF and Dwarf, were that with a CTF archive? Yes. Uh, okay. That that makes a big difference, of course. But if you don't have the CTF archive, the CTF archive time takes another, I don't know, 10 minutes. So it's very fast as well. Or depend on the machine. Okay, <laughs> my uh, machine instead. Uh, okay, but, but but some of the the difference in timing is because you have a pre-prepared CTF yeah. archive. Yeah, the CTF, as I said, is compact. Uh, it's it's well, compact. Basically, and in the kernel build. GCC generates BT, uh, CTF, not BTF, CTF for each object in the a dot .ctf section. Then the linker mm, the duplicates it. So, so it's uh, another, another so, step. Uh, then in the CTF a, uh, file in the kernel, it basically contains the, the duplicated CTF for VM Linux and all the modules, right? That yeah. Are, yeah. So yeah, it's some yeah. work is done in that. But yeah. But they will not add for the, the 35 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> there is also a, a, a trick, let's say a trick. Yeah, the, because in those 35 minutes which you spend there for B Dwarf, you spend it also most in IO operations. You need to go to each object, open it up, read, so on and so forth. So I do not know how to weight that. I can again provide a bit of info here because back in the day we had a not very nice tool which did exactly the same thing to generate CTF, opening all the, uh, all the dwarf and using a much worse deduplicated and deduplicated. It took about five minutes to read all the dwarf in. Yeah. Um, which is nothing like 35 again. So it must be spending its time doing something else. Yeah, it's something to us to work on. I mean, but anyhow, you can see that the memory consumption in the CTF case, it's much less. Yeah, it's under one gig, one the other one was, I do not know, two gigs. So that is another uh, advantage point. So here it's, uh, this is a real life experiment which you do, which you do uh, basically comparing the compatibility between two kernel releases. Um, this is the CTF, uh, memory time footprint. You will see that it's a, it takes a long time with you know, almost no memory consumption. There is happening the RPM unzipping. And then we start reading the CTF, uh, building the internal representation and comparing. So here we have 
reading the CTF, building the entire uh, representation in LibAbigail, and comparing the two ABIs, which uh, are resulted. But this, you know, gives us, you know, 216 sec seconds, and again, we have under one gig of, uh, of memory consumption. Let's see what is happening when we have a pure dwarf uh, backend. Uh, so you can see at, at this moment that the difference is not so large, and I explain you why. Uh, but the memory consumption footprint also, uh, it's, it's, all, it's a larger, it's, it, it, it is consistent here. So we have two gigabytes uh, roughly of memory consumption uh, during this, uh, this um, uh, uh, comparison. You'll see again the straight line in the beginning, it's deal with uh, RPM unzipping and uh, organization. Then we have, you can see again, an, uh, a peak, which is dwarf uh, reading uh, in, uh, um, and also uh, make it in, in uh, putting it the dwarf information in the internal representation of uh, Liba Abigail. And then what is happening, the next peak, is basically to be the the, the 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 comparison between the two uh, ABIs. Yeah. So you might wonder why why before was you know the difference like 70 times difference. So here the the the, the time consu uh, the time is consumed by the actual difference between the two corpus the two ABI corpuses. So for example, if you have a larger time, a larger uh, um, kernel ABI white list, the graphs look more or less the same, but the last part will grow. Yeah, so the last part will grow. Probably, you know, uh, on a very large projects might not make, in time, time wise, might not make too much difference between CTF and, and uh, Dwarf, because, uh, yeah, reading a CTF on Dwarf, it will become uh, the, the activity, that activity will become minimal. But what will be, will remain, will still remain is the memory foot, footprint. So using CTF, at least in uh, this moment to LibAbigail, it's much better than using Dwarf. It will give you a, a smaller a foot, a memory footprint. This is the same thing uh, in a graphical way, uh, in a, a tabular way. And this is almost conclude my talk. It's uh, some key points. I think I already talked about them during my talk. It's uh, the CTF is at this moment, I think the most important stuff is that it's continuously tested using the new infrastructure. So the, the chance of having the CTF backend in LibAbigail not working drops dramatically. Uh, we uh, improved uh, the performance of LibAbigail in general and uh, on, of the CTF backend in particular uh, in the last six, eight months. And of course, I uh, encourage everyone to use the CTF backend for uh, for bringing savings in, t in times of in terms of times and memory consumption. This is it. If you have questions, thank you. Sure. I shouldn't be monopolizing this, but just a couple of notes. F firstly, I was, sh I was somewhat shocked when I saw that second graph because that looks like it's coming out at a quarter of a second per symbol in the ABI, in the, in the ABI list, overhead just for using dwarf. I suspect this is less shocking than it seems because it's not one type. It's, it's the time it takes to recurse down a whole type graph for every one of those symbols and deduplicate it. So the point yeah. of taking a quarter of a second to do that for a symbol is not actually that horrifying. It's still a bit disturbing, though. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that while this is focused on the kernel, CTF works in user space as well. Oh, yeah. Unlike yeah. CTF. So you can use, you can use Abigail, assuming you can prevent RPM or whatever from stripping the CTF out, which it really shouldn't. Um, you can use minus GCTF and Abigail to compare the ABIs of shared libraries as well in exactly the same way. Yeah, but I think that is the, 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 the main goal of Abigail, to, so to change, yeah. It's not just kernels. It's not just kernels, yeah. I think the kernels, it's something new, yeah which we added.
Sehr gerne. Ja? Sehr gerne. Hi. Hi. Uh, is CTF only so much faster because it is so much smaller, or are there other reasons why it is? Yeah, it's because it's smaller, because it, we have this uh, CTF archive, mm -hmm. which basically removes all the duplication. So if you don't need to pro process the, the same data over and over again, then that improves a lot. But there are no other reasons why it is? Uh, no, no. So okay. basically, because CTF, it's, it's, it contains the minimum what you yeah. need. While Dwarf is, you get everything there. It doesn't matter, of course, because 10 times faster is 10 times faster. Yeah, well, it's only the read. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it would be interesting otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. So, uh, Nick actually works on CTF BTF integration. So, most probably, CTF will become the same thing like BTF uh, in how long? One year, two years? <laughs> It's half done already, so I hope a few months. Oh, um, a few months, okay. Uh, and and uh, there's, there's still a sort of superset on top of BTF, but most things should be able to be, be emitted as BTF as long as you don't mind losing things like symbol lookup. Yeah. But I, I think the, indeed. the major improvement there it will be the duplication part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes. So it's in the very beginning you mentioned it's the C primarily C at this moment. Yes. So if it's uh, the user land, uh, try to use the uh, Libra Abigail to compare the API, then not only C program will use it. Yes. So it's other language. So is this easy to expand, expand to? You should ask the guy <laughs> close to you. <laughs> it's, uh, the question really is, how much expansion do we want? I mean, if you were looking at C++, for example, you certainly don't want to include all the details of templates and so on and so forth. I think probably the right way to go is to say that what CTF's job is to encode the C-compatible ABI of the, t uh, of, of the type system. So you, prob you, you might want to encode things like, is the, are, are these things public or private? But you don't want all the details of C++ and uh, Rust monomorphization and so on. Yeah. Uh, there's been no attempt to do any of, this any of this expansion yet, but I don't see why you couldn't use it to tell if, for example, C++ programs have broken ABI in some way, because it's going to affect the C compatible subset as well if they do. And uh, we're encoding. We should be able to encode that without changing the format. Any, you notice. Uh, on, on the other hand, you know, if you st start to if, if you start to <laughs> support everything there, you end up in the dwarf format. Yeah, exactly. There's got to so be you you need to. Way. So I'm gonna be, if it expands, it will be cautiously. Yeah, because then people will ask, why do you want CTF when you have dwarf? It has everything in. Yeah. So if I expand it too fast, Elaine will get very unhappy. <laughs> Yeah, so then this, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, just one comment about, yeah, like CTF only supporting C and not C++ or Rust or other primary languages. That's right. However, um, the use case of CTF that also, also with, that the same happened with BTF in the kernel, that at least we are seeing is basically like not debugging. So people don't really use CTF for debugging. I mean, for offline debugging, like getting GDB and looking at, you use Dorf because that is what it's for. So that means that I don't think that for CTF to support C++ or even Rust, I don't think the format will require to support source level constructs. Like, because probably to support realized types, like realized structs or realized physical layouts will be enough. And this is very relevant because, for example, in the kernel, they are now in experimenting and getting rust in the kernel. So then, of course, the question showed up like, oh, is BTF enough to support rust types? And it turns out we are still discussing that, but it turns out that you don't really have to support like the rust super high level source constructions like for like traits, this or that. All you have to do is to be able to support like the realized type. And I, I'm not a C++ expert, but maybe the same will happen, will apply to C++ and CTF. Yeah. 
with templates, for example. Do you need templates information no, for the CTF level so. for building an ABI corpus? I don't think so. For the bugging, definitely yes. So. Okay, so first question, uh, what's BTF in this context? I'm not aware. BTF, it's uh, use, uh, what, sorry? I'm not aware of it. Uh, BTF, of, you don't know about this, BTF. What's the, what does it expand to? BTF, uh, I don't know exactly the, the it's the, 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 is the debug information associated with the Berkeley package filter. Ah, okay, okay. I, I'm, no. It's another descendant of the old Sun CTF type format, but this was is basically used to, to, uh, to, for the similar similar purposes to CTF, but specifically by things like for, for things like kernel type verification and that sort of thing. Um, it's they're similar enough. I hope to hope to merge the two together. So um, yeah, so it's, it's very it's very similar. It doesn't have much to do with the Berkeley packet filter anymore because BPF doesn't have much to do with the Berkeley packet filter anymore. It's well, a virtual machine that runs in the kernel, which is yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thanks. And um, second question: I, I did not really understand the like the difference between your two set of graphs because uh, so in the first case, you it's the time taken to generate the ABI description from CTF or Dwarf, and like, yeah, it takes 35 minutes for Dwarf. And in the second set of graph, my understanding was that it was a super set of that, like reading, reading the ABI from two kernel trees, kernel builds, yeah. and then comparing it. So, yes, but, but it takes much less time, so I don't understand yeah, why it went be from because here you have thousands, thousands of symbols and functions to look over. They are not 853. Maybe they are 5,000, 10,000. Yeah. Okay, so there's more symbols in that one than in the second experiment? Yeah. So here, there are way more. Okay. Yes. So this is, I, I showed, you know, you have, let's say, a project like, uh, like Firefox, it, it, you go over all the public function, public symbols, you get all the information about function arguments, function return arguments, and you build the ABI corpus. Yeah, so this, it will take you, let's say, 35 minutes. However, if you say, my, my uh, API to the external world of my project doesn't have 20,000 functions and, uh, and, variable, and uh, variables, it has only 20, then it's, that's 20 to be used as a filter. Okay, so that was that, that, that's what the whitelist was for. Yeah, the whitelist, it's a filter. Thanks. The whitelist filters out what you read. What you care about. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't need, once you see that symbol, exactly at the, it ha the filtering is happening at the reading moment. Mm -hmm. So when the symbol is uh, it's read, it, it is not any longer converted uh, processed by Libabigail is dropped there and moved to the next one. Ah. So this is the reason, that is the biggest, uh, the biggest um, equalizer factor between the two graphs. You need to remember to update it uh, when adding a new, new function to your ABI. Yeah, uh, anyhow, if you don't remember, you'll get a lot of errors, you know, saying that those functions are not compatible or they're not there and you, you, you'll figure out that something is wrong when the report is generated. Yeah. And uh, just if we have time, I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, in the past we've generated like ABI reports from Dwarf, like in XML, I think it is. Sorry? It, it, in the past for our programs, we generated uh, it like the ABI report and saved it from the dwarf. If we generate it with CTF now, do you think we can compare the old ones with? Yeah, the it new should ones? be compared to that. If it's not, comp then let me let us know to see what is the problem. Maybe we miss something in dwarf. We miss something in CTF. Okay. But most of, uh, I mean, the idea is that they are compatible. The information. Okay. Thanks. Just out of curiosity, when you say comparing, were you comparing uh, Lib Abigail's XML dumps of the ABI? Okay. Was it the XML ABI, uh, ABI corpus? Yeah. 
Yeah, it, the XML, yeah, it breaks, yeah. Okay. We can talk offline. I was just curious how you were doing that because I tried to do it for glibc for a while, but uh, a lot of things changed, so you have to track stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, it's more a question about CTF format. Um, I'm wondering if you are already aware of this usage in like embedded software where the, lim the space is much more limited. Mm -hmm. And because I can see where it could be useful compared to Dwarf uh, to remote debugging on, on a real board or something like this. And I'm wondering if it's already something out. It, it depends what you want to do in the in the embedded world. If you want to debug, probably CTF is not enough. If you want to have uh, information about data types, and then, uh, for example, in the embedded world, I can imagine you know you have a system running on the machine, and you want to have some kind of automatic way to check if the new uh, modules you should put there is compatible with whatever is there, yes, you can use uh, CTF, but not for the debugging. And so for example, generating stack trace, or uh, could be useful or? I think yes. Okay. It, uh, it doesn't provide stack backtracing through, that's, that, that, that's what um, Indus um, S frame, yeah. S frame is for. Um, it was originally called CTF frame, but we considered that a somewhat bad name because it doesn't actually have anything format related related to CTF. It, they, they, they're just compact in similar in similar ways. But as an, as an example of the sort of crazy thing I thought you could do with it, you could have a wrapper around DL open and DL and DL sim, um, which uh, uh, which looks at the C uh, at the CTF of the library you're about to open and, verif and verifies that it's still compatible with uh, with the DL sim call you're about to make before making the call because the .ctf section is is in the, is in the binary but not loaded. You can use libctf to open it and ask you know what's the properties of this symbol? Is it the same as I'm expecting? This doesn't exist yet, but it would be about five lines of libctf calls. <laughs> This sounds very interesting, but please don't do a wrap on DLSIM and use the audit interface instead, which we provide in glibc. Uh, you can use Solaris documentation, it's mostly compatible. Yeah, I, I second that. There is an auditor interface, and the auditor can do symbol binding, and you can detect that symbol binding, whether that was present. Um, we had considered doing this at one point with notes for ABI compatibility, but I agree with you. If CTF was, is compact enough that you stored the call and then you looked up the uh, resolved target, you could then compare really quickly. And the really quick thing is the problem and is always the open question, how do you do that quickly at runtime? Some people may really care about this, yeah. Yes, I, I agree with that, yeah. But if you have thousands of DSOs, then the question becomes, what's the impact? Uh, yeah. Um, one thing I have been thinking of exporting somehow um, is that dur during deduplication, we actually come up with hash codes, for e uh, SHU1 hash codes for every, for every type. Uh, which recursively depend on the hash codes of every other type and then use those to deduplicate. If we exported that somehow, you could use that to do a unit time check to see if things were the same or not. I don't know how we'd export them, and obviously it would make things much bigger. But what we could do is, comp is compute them on the spot or something like that, and then, you could, uh, and then, you, uh, and then query to find out, are these the same? Um, some, anyway, we have the machinery. We're just not, we have, we're, we're yeah, just the, not the, exporting the, it. It might the, be useful somehow. The problem yeah, the, is that hash codes are very incompressible. Yeah. It's a, it swings around about. We might want to just sort of store hash codes for only things in exported in the exported ABI because it's all you care about. That would be probably do both. Something like that. I mean, the last piece that I'll comment on that is that there's an aspect of don't care at times that's actually really hard to encode where the caller may not care about something and it may have no ABI impact, but yet the type system still encodes it in some way and you're like, well, I didn't care about that and it should be compatible. So there, there are wrinkles, but I agree with you. It's a really cool idea. Yeah. This is it.
Thank you.